Yesterday's Prophecies for Today's World. Just remember that this is a time when we all have to be bold and share the simple gospel of Jesus Christ with people. And now, Hal Lindsey presents the Bible Prophecy Series, The Coming of the Last World Superpower. All right, let's turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 36. You know, I find that more and more I am studying the prophecies of Ezekiel chapters 34 through 39 because they're basically one message and one prophecy about the end times. But I find myself studying this more and more because it is so applicable to what we see today. I believe that it is a clear warning to anyone who tries to force the Israelis to give up their land because that, that puts us right in the crosshairs of what God predicts he will do to the nations who meddle with his land and take it away from his people. Now, let's read in chapter 36, beginning with verse 1. And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Now, it isn't often that God speaks to land. He's not speaking to people here. He's speaking to the land. And he says to that land, hear the word of the Lord. Then he says, thus says the Lord God, because the enemy has spoken against you, saying, aha, and the everlasting heights have become our possession, Therefore prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God, for good cause they have made you desolate and crushed you from every side, that you should become a possession of the rest of the nations, and you have been taken up in the talk and the whispering of the people. Now, in verse 3, he says, okay, for good cause you have been made desolate. Now, why is that? because God predicted he was going to discipline Israel for their unbelief. The prophet Moses in Deuteronomy predicted that Israel would be destroyed as a nation twice in their future, and they hadn't even gone in to possess the land yet. Yet he said, in your future, you're going to uh, have your nation destroyed twice. The first time will be by a mighty nation from your north, they will swoop down on you, and they will take you captive into their land. Well, that was the Neo-Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar that did it that time. And then he shows that they would continue to, they would return, they would continue to disobey the Lord. And the second time, he says, then I will cast you out, and I will take you to all of the nations in the world. And there you will have no assurance of life. You'll fear day and night. And he said, you're going to, the land is going to be made a desolation. Many other prophecies added to that. That was the second destruction, which began in 70 AD when the Romans and the 10th Legion destroyed them. And yet, even Jesus, who predicted that destruction, said that Jerusalem would be tread underfoot until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So he put a terminus on that dispersion throughout the world and the destruction of their land and, and the uh, walking by Gentiles possessing Jerusalem. So this prophecy here refers to the time when the Lord would bring the Israelites back from this worldwide dispersion and begin to restore the land from the utter desolation that it was under. You follow me? It's important to place the time that this prophecy was to be fulfilled. Now, we know that beginning in the middle of the 19th century, the Israelites 
being under great persecution throughout Europe, began to return to Palestine. Yet, they didn't really get serious until World War II. When the Holocaust took place, they began to go against all odds back to the land of Palestine or the land of Israel. And against all odds, in 1948, they became a nation. All right, well, that, that is part fulfillment of what Ezekiel is predicting here. And Ezekiel predicted this 2,600 years ago. So let's continue to read here. So he says in verse 4, Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, to the hills, to the ravines, to the valleys, to the desolate wastes, and to the forsaken cities which have become a prey and a derision to the rest of the nations which are around about you. Now notice, who are the nations that, are, that have caused all of this? He says they are the nations that surround you. What nations surround Israel? Muslim nations. Muslim nations. When did the promised land become an utter desolation? Well, when the, when the Roman legions destroyed Israel in 70 AD and dis dispersed the people throughout the world, there were still Christians that came there. And there were Christians in the Byzant Byzantine uh, era. Christians were there, and they did keep the land up. But do you know when that land began to be a desolation? 635 A.D., when the Muslims took it over for the first time. When the Muslims took it over, that land began to be a desolation. And it grew worse and worse and worse until it was worse than a moonscape. There's no life there. They didn't take care of it. They, the rulers of the other nations of, of uh, Islam didn't spend much time there or anything like that. Jerusalem was just a little uh, backwoods city until the Christians tried to take it back in the Crusades, and then it became important again. But basically, it became a desolation of the Muslims. So this prophecy is basically talking about those nations who surround Israel and who with scorn of soul took it over and made it into a desolation. All right, let's read on. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy, I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom. Edom is a, uh, one of the Arab tribes, but it's used in prophecy sometimes to represent all of the Arab nation. And it's used in that sense here. So he's specifically pointing out who he's warning here about destroying his land and taking it over. So he says, and I have spoken, in the, uh, spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, who what? Appropriated whose land? My land. Who's speaking? It isn't the Arabs' land. It isn't the Muslims' land. It isn't the Jews or the Israelites' land. Whose land is it? God's land, and he gives it to whomever he pleases. And he made an everlasting covenant with the people of Israel. He predicted that they would be dispersed in discipline, but he said he would bring them back. And the Israelites are the only people on the face of this earth who have a title deed to land on this planet. Do you know that? They're the only people who have a title deed to, to land on this planet. The rest of us have nothing. Every foot of land that we Gentiles have taken has been by the right of conquest. You trace it back far enough, it, it was because we took it. I'll tell you, it is a dangerous thing 
to walk right into a very specific prophecy that is aimed at the very time we live in and to start saying, I feel passionately about taking away this land and giving it to the Palestinians. Does God express any passion here? In the fire of my jealousy. Man, I don't want to get in the way of that. And he's warning all the nations that have messed around with his land. And especially those who would keep it from the people to whom he gave it. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains, to the hills, to the ravines, and to the valleys. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and my, in my wrath because you have endured the insults of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have sworn that surely the nations which are around you will themselves endure their insults. But you, O mountains of Israel, you will put forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people Israel, for they will soon come home. See, he's speaking to that time when they would come. And he says, they will soon come home. Well, they have come home. You know, I, I can see the hand of God so clearly in, in my lifetime. I thank, I'm so thankful to have been privileged to be born in the time that I was born because I was alive, I was 18 when Israel was born as a nation against all odds. I watched after I became a Christian, especially I became a Christian just in time for the Suez crisis. I've been watching what's happened over there for a long, long time. And you can see the hand of God all the time. Israel is God's key to prophecy. If you want to understand what time it is in God's prophetic timetable, just look at what's going on in Israel. Now, I, I've watched some things, and this is, a, I believe it's a correct theory, but it is my theory. I believe that God brought these people back just when he wanted to, and in 1948 and 49, they fought that war of independence. They became a state. And, you know, I've carefully analyzed what Israel had in the way of an army and what they had in the way of equipment and how they had to get equipment there and, uh, and how they defeated five, no, by that time it was seven organized Muslim states who had been equipped with the best weapons that uh, Russia had to get to them. How they could stand them off is a miracle. I mean, I just think of some of the things I know from being over there in Israel so many times, uh, leading tours and getting to know uh, so many Israelis, many that lived through these things. Uh, it's just amazing. Like, they had, uh, the Egyptians had bombers that they'd gotten in 1948. Israel had no air force. And somehow they managed to buy six Messerschmitt 109s that had been left over from the Germans in uh, World War II, and the Czechoslovakians had them. They managed to buy them. They sent uh, some pilots over there, most of whom had been trained by the RAF and had fought for Britain during World War II, even though they were Jews. They sent them over there to take possession of these planes. They could only refuel once and in a in a very secret airfield. And after that, there was no place, no friendly country, anything that they could refuel those planes. And they flew them, and every one of those fighters was on fumes when they got to Israel. There was nothing left in any of their tanks. And the pilots said, we don't know how we got here. We just don't know how we got here. These are, I could multiply stories like this all over. It was a miracle what happened. So it, clearly what I'm trying to say is the hand of God was there. God brought them back as he predicted here. 
Against every odd, he made them a state, which he said he would do. And then I believe that God did something for the Israelis that he wanted them to begin to believe him and trust him and see that it was the hand of God that was doing things for them. In 1967, they, they beat the best equipped Arab armies that had ever been assembled in six days. I mean, totally beat them. The Israeli Air Force destroyed the Egyptian Air Force, the Syrian Air Force, and the Jordanian Air Force in the first hours of the war. Most of them on the ground. And they took back Jerusalem and gained sovereign control over Jerusalem for the first time in 2,550 years. You think that was an accident? No. I believe God did it. He gave them all of the land that is promised in the covenant. Virtually all the land that's promised in the covenant he gave to them in that battle in six days. And I believe that God did that in order to get his people to begin to really turn to him and to begin to really trust him. But you know what? They didn't. And so they got cocky, and he gave them the Yom Kippur War. They almost lost that one. They lost a lot of men. Some turned and began to see what was going on and turned to faith, but most didn't. And ever since then, there's been one problem for them after another. It's God's way. But you see, he gave them an example of what he can do when he's with them in 1967. On June 4th, 1967, the infant state of Israel found itself on the brink of annihilation. Israelis still lived with the agonizing memory of the Holocaust. Now the Arab nations surrounding Israel vowed to make the blue Mediterranean run red with the blood of Jews. We were thinking in terms of the Israelis are going to be thrown to the water. On the morning of June 5th, 1967, Eitan ben Eliyahu flew one of the first missions against Egyptian airfields in the Sinai. This is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of Israel is going to be destroyed. Uh, people were in panic. Uh, People were talking about uh, the imminent destruction of the state of Israel, of a war in which there will be an enormous number of casualties, at least 10,000 people will be killed. Rabbis in Jerusalem anticipated so many deaths, they actually designated all of the public parks in Jerusalem as cemeteries. Just before the war, the joke in Israel was, last ones out, turn off the lights. But this black humor didn't mask the fear that many Israelis genuinely anticipated a catastrophe. Israel found itself outnumbered and outgunned on three fronts, Egypt to the south, Jordan to the east, and Syria to the north. The Soviet Union had poured $2 billion worth of arms into the Arab nations. Israel's enemies brought twice as many soldiers, three times as many tanks, and four times as many airplanes to the battlefield. But just before the war, Egypt, Israel's main enemy, suffered a series of major mistakes and mishaps. There was this uh, uh, miscommunication between the president Nasser uh, and his top generals and everything didn't work according to what they sold. And when the war broke, uh, you could see and hear, which we did. We heard them. You could see and hear that the Egyptian high command was not in control. Egypt's high command also dismissed warnings by mid-level Egyptian intelligence officers of an imminent Israeli air attack. The night before the war, Egypt's commander-in-chief, Abed Amir, gathered his high command for a party at an airbase far away from the front lines. They were caught uh, by surprise, totally. I mean, some of them were trying to uh, take to the air in order to join their units. They couldn't do it. 
Two weeks before the war, Egypt replaced nearly all of its commanders in Sinai with officers unfamiliar with the terrain. On the morning of June 5th, Jordanian radar detected the Israeli Air Force taking off. They sent a red alert to Cairo, but the decoding officer used the wrong day's code and failed to decipher the vital information. The warning never came. Instead, the Israeli Air Force decimated the Egyptian Air Force on the ground, the key to the outcome of the war. Some, like author Sarah Rigler, who's written on the Six-Day War, believe this series of Egyptian mistakes reveals the work of an unseen hand. You can say, oh, wow, what a lucky coincidence, where you can see the divine hand. We see that, that God arranged all these things to happen the way they did because he wanted the Israeli strike to succeed. He wanted us to win. He wanted us to regain our holy places. To some, the confusion in the Egyptian command just before the war evoked memories of the biblical story of Gideon routing the enemies of Israel. Instead of annihilation, Israel won one of the most decisive victories in military history. Many Orthodox Jews and Christians believe the Jewish nation had witnessed a miracle. For evangelical Christians, the Six-Day War was a huge moment of seeing God's hand intervene on behalf of the Jewish people. I mean, that was really was, I think, so extraordinary, is that you had this moment where uh, Arab leaders, Islamic leaders, were saying, we're going to throw Jews into the sea, and it looked like another Holocaust was imminent. And suddenly, in six days, uh, the Jewish people uh, defended themselves, destroyed their enemies, uh, tripled their land, recaptured control of Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years, and on the seventh day they rested. That just sounded way too biblical for, uh, for evangelicals all over the planet, and they, uh, they rejoiced with the Jewish people. In the immediate aftermath of the war, everyone, religious and secular alike, recognized that this was from God because it was just so implausible. I mean, here everybody was expecting a tremendous defeat. This is a miracle. Even Moshe Dayan, who was the commander of the Israeli forces and who was a very secular person, he went to visit the Western Wall the day after it was liberated. And there's a tradition to put, you know, like put little notes to God in the wall. So he put a little note to God between the crevices of the wall. And of course, as soon as he left, the newspaper men in their typical <laughs> discreet way <laughs> ran and took the note out and read it. What did it say? And it was a line from Psalms that said, this is from God. It's wondrous in our eyes. He's going to continue to teach them lessons. But there's one thing about what God says in uh, Ezekiel and other passages, and that is this, that when God brought them back from that worldwide dispersion and put them back in their land and caused the land to begin to respond to them, they, they made that land a garden. Beautiful. The land has responded to them when it wouldn't respond to anybody else. And he has, he, he has uh, brought them there, but now because they haven't really turned with all their hearts to trust him, they're having one problem after another. But God says the nation he founded there in these last days will not be destroyed. So no matter what they throw at them, they're not going to destroy Israel, though they're going to go through a lot of trial and trouble. And they finally will get the point when the carpenter from Nazareth comes back as who he really is, the king of kings and lord of lords. And they're going to be, there's going to be a believing remnant that turns to him with all their heart. Now look with me. In verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. 
for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. You see, he's done that, and he is doing that. Turn to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapters 12, 13, and 14 are one prophecy that deals with the same time as Ezekiel 36 to 39 deals with. Only this deals with the more advanced uh, problem of the war of Armageddon. Now, it begins in chapter 12, and it says, The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundations of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling. Literally in the Hebrew, it's a cup that causes drunkenness so that people will be reeling in drunkenness. And he says he's going to cause that cup to cause drunkenness to all the people around. Now, this once again is that word that means all the people that live around, immediately around Israel. Who are they? Muslims. So he's going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes drunkenness to all the people around them. They're going to act like they're drunk. Now, he's sitting, what do people do when they're drunk? Stupid things. They can, uh, they can uh, many times act with a fiery passion that uh, comes with being drunk, and, and they can rush into things that are not in their best interest. Now, drunkenness, by the way, is also used in the Bible in connection with a fiery, religiously inspired passion. In other words, he's going to make them drunk with this passion for Jerusalem. Now, he says, and when the siege comes against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. And it will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone, a heavy burdensome stone for all the peoples. Now, this is, reaches from the people around them to all the people of the world. God is going to cause Jerusalem to become this gigantic burden to the whole world. And everyone that tries to deal with this burden, tries to lift it up and put it out of the way, will be destroyed. Everyone that tries to get involved with manipulating uh, how Jerusalem is going to be handled tries to get involved with it, it's going to be destroyed. And he, then it says, even though all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Now, today, the Muslim nations, especially those in the Middle East, have found a way that whatever troubles them, they can trouble the world with it. In other words, the world has to be concerned with what troubles the Arabs, don't they? Why? Because they have their hand on the oil spigot. So, you know, it was basically the Western nations that discovered oil for them and developed it for them, and that was in the late 19th century. And yet it was just in the right time to develop this oil that would give them the uh, political leverage to trouble the world with whatever troubled them. And what troubles the Arab world the most? Having Jews in control of what they claim is their third holiest city. Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem. Now, they didn't discover that passion for Jerusalem for a long, long time after Muhammad, but when they saw it was important to the 
Christians, they had to claim it was theirs too. So they, then they declared it their third holy city just to tick us off. Most, most Muslims don't even know the name Jerusalem. They call it Al-Quds, which means the farthest mosque. But the, the Muslim world today is drunk with this passion for taking back Jerusalem. And the issue of Jerusalem has been and is becoming even more so the greatest problem that w the whole world will have to deal with and try to handle. When God declares things as clearly as he declares uh, in Ezekiel and in this passage where he says anyone that tries to, to throw that stone out of the way, the issue of Jerusalem out of the way, will be destroyed by it. And he says that all of those who try to take his land, take it away from those that he gave it to, he says, I'm going to come down in my fiery wrath on you. We better stop looking and listen. I know that God will always keep his promises to his people. I know that God said, let us fear lest a promise being left us of entering his rest. Any of you should come short of it. And he says that his rest is still available to every believer in Jesus Christ in the midst of whatever trouble we may be in. And if we just claim his promises, he will take care of us. And I know that he will. I know that uh, when God says, fear not, for I am with you, be not dismayed, for I am your God, I will help you, I'll strengthen you, and uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness, I know we'll keep that. And I know that there's exciting times for us Christians coming. So just put all of this in God's hands. It isn't too late. And I pray and want you to pray that God will be defending the United States for the sake of the believing remnant that's in it. Join us next week for How Lindsay. But when you really get a grip on the fact that Jesus so saves you, when you simply admit your sins and receive the gift of pardon, that you are already in heaven as far as he's concerned. Thank you so much for standing with me as a watchman on the wall. I pray daily that he will reward your faithfulness and protect and prosper you in these difficult times. Thank you again for being a vital part of my team.